Well, if you've made it this far, we can't leave those s orbitals hanging in two-dimensional space on their own. Here we're going to put in the p orbitals, sigma and pi, and then develop the final band diagram for our 2D system. All right, let's see if we can handle p orbitals, because things get slightly tricky. So for 2D p-type crystal orbitals, and again defining the plane of our square lattice as the xy plane, then for the px atomic orbitals, I'm going to be sigma along x. We've already seen that. What type, bonding, antibonding, will depend on the sign changes. But along the other direction, the y direction, as I stack them up in 2D, we're going to see it's pi. Let's take a look. So now at our gamma point, kx and ky are both zero. Let's have a look at the kx equals zero first. Again, we're just laying them all down with the same signs. We've seen this before in our 1D system. And now along y, we'll have no sign changes because ky is also zero. And we just add all of them with no phase changes. Let's take a look at the energetic consequences of this. We know already for sigma p interactions along a row, that's going to give us sigma star antibonding interactions. Because even though we've laid them all down with the same signs, because of the symmetry of the orbital, it gives us out of phase cancellation between the two atoms. Now along the y direction, they're overlapping with pi bonding. And furthermore, because there are no sign changes, in this case, those interactions are favorable. They're overlapping in phase, and they're bonding. Let's systematically change kx from 0 up to pi over a, but we'll keep ky equal to 0. So we'll fix ky, and we'll go to our so-called x point, which is kx pi over a, ky equal to 0. Let's lay them down. Now I have kx as pi over a, so I'm alternating signs. And I know in this case, for the sigma p interactions, when I alternate signs, that's going to give me favorable bonding sigma interactions. Ky, that's still 0. So off we go. We just repeat whatever sign arrangement I had in this row, repeat it over and over so there are no sign changes in the y direction. Now everything's bonding. We're bonding along x. We're bonding along y, the former being sigma, the latter being pi bonding. Now we'll change ky. We'll take ky from 0, as we had here, up to pi over a. So first, let's start off with kx equals 0, but ky is pi over a. That'll be our so-called y point. So kx is 0, no sign changes. ky, however, we're going to change all of these signs. We flip them all. So I'll reverse the orientation of each p orbital, or reverse the orientation of the entire row, if you like. Minus, 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 minus. No sign changes, still along x. But now we can see we're getting out of phase pi interactions along the y direction. Let's add the next one. Along y, all the signs change. And again. So we look along any given channel, if you like, here, we see a sign alternation, plus, minus, plus, minus. What do we have now? Well, along x, we know at kx equals 0 for the p's, that's anti-bonding of the sigma star variety. And for ky now, being pi over a, I'm alternating signs, I get pi star anti-bonding interactions between every set of neighboring atomic orbitals. That's very high energy. Finally, let's go to kx pi over a, ky pi over a, our endpoint. kx pi over a, I'm changing signs, plus minus, plus minus. I'm doing the same along y. Flip them each time. There's my crystal orbital at the pi over a, pi over a point. Let's look at the bonding interactions x, I know pi over a, kx, gives me sigma bonding interactions. Everybody's interacting in phase. But now at pi over a for ky, the pi bonding is out of phase, anti-bonding between every single neighbor. 
So let's just summarize those band energies on an EK diagram. So there's my gamma point, kx, ky equals zero, a sigma star along x, in phase bonding along y of the pi variety, we'll put the energy up here. When I go to the y point here, where I have kx equals zero, ky equals pi over a, and as we saw in the last slide, that gives us anti-bonding in the extreme along both directions, the highest possible energy. Now we'll go to the x point, that means that ky is zero, kx now is pi over a, and in this case we have bonding interactions along x, because we're alternating signs. We also have bonding interactions along y, because we're not changing signs, ky is zero. That is the lowest possible energy crystal orbital. And now we can just add how the crystal orbital energies change as I gradually go from the gamma point to the x point, and of course from the gamma point up to the y point. Infinite number of crystal orbitals between these extremes. Let's add another gamma point on our diagram on the right here. Let's just place it down. It has the same energy as our gamma point that we used on the left. We're putting it there so we can plot the change in energy going from gamma to the m point, where kx is equal to ky up to a maximum of pi over a pi over a at the m point. So here is the energy of that m point crystal orbital because they're both pi over a along x. When I flip signs, that's good, it gives me bonding interactions. But along the y, for the pi interactions, they become anti-bonding. And so this is going to be higher energy than my x point, but lower energy than my gamma point, because what I've done here is made the sigma interactions favorable as opposed to unfavorable. And again, we just join the dots, if you like, from gamma to m. These will be the energies of all the possible crystal orbitals with varying number of nodes. And finally, now I can just join x to m. And there's my complete diagram for the px band. Because the plane of my 2D atom arrangements is the xy plane, we might expect that the py orbitals will give a similar type of band diagram, because they're just rotated by 90 degrees. And we'll see that's going to be the case, but we flip the energies at the x and y points. Let's take a look. For the PY bands, for gamma, for the PY, let's think about what we're doing. KY is equal to zero. This is my Y axis. This is plus, 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 plus. But because it's sigma interactions now along the Y axis, that's going to be sigma star because they're all anti-bonding. For the PY orbitals, the pi interactions are along X. And at KX zero, they're all in phase. Here's my M point energy. Again, it's just a simple rotation from before, and nothing's really changed except the axes along which the pi and sigma interactions are occurring. What has changed, though, now is the x and y point energies flip. At the x point, kx is equal to pi over a, alternating signs for these py orbitals. Now I've got pi star interactions. Along the y direction, at the x point, ky is equal to zero, lay them all down plus 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 but that gives me sigma star interactions and now at the y point for the py orbitals that is going to be the most stable crystal orbital in the system we have kx is equal to zero no sign changes in the x direction so i have pi in phase interactions along y because it's the y point that means along y it's pi over a i'm alternating flipping them up and down that gives me sigma bonding interactions along y. Both in phase, both bonding, lowest energy. Now let's plot the px and the py bands on the same diagram. They're degenerate everywhere except at the x and y points. The gamma point energies for both bands are the same. I've just displaced the y a little bit lower in reality falls right on top of it, so you can see there's two of them. The endpoint energies are the same. The only difference is at the X point, that's the lowest energy for the PX band, and the highest energy for the PY band 
but for the y point that's the lowest energy for the py band and it's same as the energy of the px at the x point and so I lose the degeneracy of the orbitals as I go towards x and towards y they become singly degenerate We've got one set of orbitals left, the PZ orbitals, which are perpendicular to the 2D atom arrangement, and those are going to form pi-type crystal orbitals. And we're going to see the combinations and energy changes for the PZs are essentially the same as the S-type sigma band. So let's look at this PZ pi band. Here's my EK diagram with different directions, different points. Let's start with the gamma point. And here I'm just drawing, if you like, the top of the lobe of these pi forming orbitals. At the zero, zero point, I'm in phase along x and y, bonding in both directions. And I've added two gamma points here because we're going to plot from this gamma to this to x and from this gamma to the m point. Now I go to the x point, which will be the same as the y point. They become equivalent again. This is pi over a zero or zero pi over a. Let's see if we can figure out which one is drawn here. This is x, and I can clearly see that I'm alternating signs along x, so that must be pi over a. And as I'm going in the y direction, there are no sign changes, so that must be 0. So I've sketched this one. We can see I'm out of phase along x, in phase along y, and so I'm going to be a certainly higher energy than the gamma point. It's just summarized here. Now we'll go to the M point, alternating signs in both directions, and in this case, anti-bonding in both. So this is going to be the highest energy crystal orbital. And now let's just join the dots, and we'll add an infinite number of crystal orbitals in between them. And my PZ pi derived band is going to look something like this, where going from gamma to M, I'm always keeping kx and ky equal, 0, 0 here at the gamma point, pi over a, pi over a at the m point. And along this direction, either kx or ky is 0, while the other can vary from 0 up to pi over a. Right, so we've seen the s, the px, the py, pz, let's put them all together. And now here's my final band diagram for my 2D system. Here's my s band. Here's my PZ band, similar shapes, right? Typically, though, the S is at a lower energy than the PZ. And here are my PX and PY bands, degenerate from the gamma point to M, and then splitting when I go to that X point, coming back together at the gamma point. And so this is the complete band diagram, the spaghetti diagram. But now, hopefully, we know what that hanging spaghetti means and how to interpret it. The exact dispersion of the bands, remember that's the energy difference from the highest and lowest energy, crystal orbitals, just how wide these are, that's going to depend on the specific system and the bond length. For the example that I've drawn, I've shown that there's an energy gap between the top of the S-band, the highest energy crystal orbital for the S-band, and the lowest possible energy crystal orbital for the PXPY band. And I've shown here that those don't overlap, that there's a gap. And so on the left, gone back to our old rudimentary box picture. How would I draw this with boxes? I'd draw a band of levels here that are S-band derived. And then I'd draw a whole box here of P-levels. And I'd have a gap between them indicating it's a semiconductor. So if I put two electrons per atom into this system. I'm going to completely fill the S-band. Let's do that in our old box picture. And it should be semiconducting. And so what that would mean with my crystal orbitals is all of these S-band orbitals, all of these crystal orbitals in red are filled. The blue and the green are completely empty. And therefore, between the two, I have an energy gap. That's my band gap. As I mentioned, the electronic behavior of such a system is going to depend on the band dispersion of specifics of the system. And really, it takes full-blown computer calculations to fully determine the energies of all of these different orientations. Here, what I've done in the, compared to the previous diagram is I've just increased the dispersion of the S-band. 
I've increased the energy difference of the lowest sigma and the highest sigma star crystal orbitals, such that now it overlaps with those p-bounds. And so now we see our hanging spaghetti has no gaps in the middle. And so in this case, because all of the s and the p-bounds overlap with each other, I'd expect this system to be metallic until I put eight electrons in it. And so now, if I put one, two, three, four, five, six, or whatever, seven, up to seven electrons, partially filling the box, but partially filling or raising the Fermi level, but never encountering an energy gap between the highest occupied crystal orbital and the lowest unoccupied crystal orbital, the system would be a metal.